she couldn't look anyone in the eye and was sweaty after telling her story? Now, why, dear viewers, do you think that after telling this particular story to a group of classmates, couldn't Wendy look them in the eyes? Hi guys, welcome to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice. Last video, we toured one of Charlie Adelson's Fort Lauderdale properties that's currently listed for sale. And my goodness, did you guys have opinions? Now, I have to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for watching the video, for subscribing to this brand new channel, and for sharing your comments on the property. Now, I learned a lot of things about you guys reading through the many hundreds of comments that were left on that video. So what did I learn exactly? Well, first things, y'all are just as nosy, if not nosier, than I am. And I'm here for it. Now, what else did I learn? The majority of people fell into one of two extreme camps about the Tortuga's house. Y'all were split. You guys either loved the property, thought it was beautiful, ready to put an offer in, or you thought it was a dumpster fire. <laughs> like I said in that video, I am not a, much of an extremist about anything. I enjoy looking at the pros and cons of situations and can often see both sides of a coin. But I absolutely loved reading some of the shade in those comments and the suggestions for what to do to the property to bring it up to modern standards. I mean, bring on HGTV and TLC back in the day when they used to have those really good renovation shows. I can tell that we're going to be very good friends. Now, because of the overwhelming support and the reception that video received and is still receiving, I realized just how much support there is for the Justice for Dan slash Lock of the Adelsons movement. While I'm firmly in support of that movement, I still want to bring a perspective that I haven't quite seen yet on YouTube. So with that said, I do still plan on branching out to other cases of interest and to highlight legal or business issues that I can shed light on based on my, you know, professional and personal experience um, to help other entrepreneurs. But for now, let's dish about the Adelsons. Back in 2015, the podcast Writing Class Radio published an episode featuring Wendy's short story. The host of the podcast offered in-person, private, and group writing classes. They recorded those classes and uploaded them as podcast episodes. They have some pretty cool stories on there and they're still uploading content. On the website for the podcast, there's a page called Meet the Class and it includes short bios and headshots for each of the students in the group writing class. Wendy was in this class and she was recorded and put onto the podcast. On Wendy's bio on the Meet the Class page, it says, Wendy Adelson is an immigration lawyer, mama of two scrumptious boys, maker of soup and marinette, who has found a home in Miami, Florida. So just from that very short bio, and it's literally only three or four lines, I have a couple questions. I would assume that each student wrote his or her own short bio as well as provided their own headshot for the webpage. Now, let me know if I'm wrong, but when you're writing a bio for yourself, do you list things in the order of importance to you or not? So, for example, she listed herself first as a lawyer and secondly, as a mother, third as a suit maker and fourth as somebody who has found a home in Miami. Just some food for thought here, because I would tend to think that if you're providing your bio on something neutral, like a writing class, meaning that it's not like a professional endeavor, it's not for her work per se, where she needs to list attorney as, you know, the most important thing. I'm just wondering if she sees herself firstly and most important, most importantly, 
as an immigration lawyer, and then second, most importantly, as a mother. I myself, I think that if I were in the same situation, I don't think that would be my order of priority, describing myself. But I mean, I could be reading way too much into this. Let me know if you agree. I don't know. Let's move on. So the show notes for the episode that features Wendy's story, and by the way, the title of that episode is Wendy Tells the Story of Her Ex-Husband's Murder. So the show notes reveal that Wendy felt like she can't publicly express how she really feels. Additionally, Wendy's sentiment is that people think she's happy even when she's not. The instructors stated, quote, I think Wendy's working on a bigger story, more than just what happened, which was that her ex-husband was murdered. Her bigger story is about what it means for her to be authentic. Wendy writes a lot about how people react when they hear her story. She also writes about her own reactions, how she wishes she could be as true in person as she is in her writing. Close quote. This comment from her instructor immediately struck me as a red flag because we all know that Wendy has written uh, what she calls a fictional story that has eerily similar circumstances to those that she was in in real life. Quick book synopsis based on Wendy's testimony at her brother Charlie's trial. Wendy wrote a book in 2011 about human trafficking the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking, the problems when it occurs, and basically how to recover it, recover from it after. This book that she wrote was set in a fictional town located in the panhandle of Florida named Hiawatha Springs, which was, quote, a small stop on the way back to what we had previously known as civilization, close quote. One of the central characters in Wendy's fictional book was a public interest lawyer named Lily Stone. Wendy testified that Lily's character was not based on herself, but a friend of hers. In the book, Lily is married to an English professor named Josh Stone. He works at a fictional university called North Florida State University. In the book, Lily laments that we moved to this godforsaken place for Josh's career. Lily demonstrates a lot of contempt for her husband, Josh, and for the situation that he's forced her to live in. Now, we all know that there are quite a lot of similarities in that story, that very short synopsis, what I just told you, and Wendy's real life, right? There are actually an uncanny number of parallels between real life Wendy and fictional Lily. In an afterword to the novel, Wendy states, I selfishly wanted you to know a bit about my story, which has much, but not all, in common with attorney Lily. By the way, when Wendy is on the stand discussing her fictional book, I don't know if her brother Charlie read this book or not, but the way the camera caught him shaking his head from side to side and whispering under his breath what I can only imagine is some curse words. Like, I can't believe my sister wrote a book about the murder of her husband. You got to see it to believe it. Let me see if I can find the clip. I'm sorry, what was your answer? Josh was an English professor. A professor, where did he teach? been a while. I wrote the book over 10 years ago. I don't remember what I named the university in the (laughs) North Florida State University. That sounds right. NFSU. NFSU sounds right. Yeah. All right. And in the book, does Lily lament, quote, we moved to this godforsaken place for Josh's career? Yes, that sounds like a line Lily would say. All right. When you looked at page 187 of the divorce document on cross, and I'll hand that back to you. Okay, so let's listen to the podcast recorded in 2015, where Wendy is reading her short story about Dan's murder. 
Just know that I'll be adding my commentary as we listen. So if you'd like to listen to the episode in full and uninterrupted, I've left the podcast link in the description box for this video. In our first class, I gave the prompt, how are you really? Wendy wrote about her ex-husband's murder. Um, on July 18th, 2014, someone shot my ex-husband in the head while he was pulling into our garage. Our garage? Wendy, you weren't living there. It wasn't your house anymore. You'd moved out and cleared the house out of all your belongings and the boys' belongings. How is it our garage? What is this? What's yours is mine? What's mine is mine? After he dropped our then three and four-year-old sons off at school. So I understand that this is a short story and all, but are you just taking artistic liberties and not portraying the facts as they actually happen? I only found out this information when the police picked me up from a lunch date I was having with two girlfriends and insisted that I come with them back to the station. Only found out. That's a strange way of revealing how you found out. You only found out that way? Like there wasn't some other way that you knew what had happened? Ugh. I didn't know about it any other way. I only found out about it this way. Really? Did they have to insist that you go to the station? What, did you initially refuse to go with them? What'd you say, I wanna finish my salad or my mimosa? I don't, I don't know what you drink at lunch. Did they have to insist after you had just seen your old street that you lived on where your boys were staying the night at, roped off by the police? And then a police comes to pick you up at lunch did they have to insist that you go with them? Were you not freaking out? And then interrogated me for eight straight hours, because it's usually the ex-wife. I'm not really okay. I list the things that are going well when people ask this question. My children are thriving and happy. We live with my parents who are incredibly devoted to our well-being. I started my own immigration practice, and I just signed up to do a one-year clerkship with the Federal 11th Circuit in September, which means I can get off Obamacare and have one year guaranteed of a steady income. But the truth is that I miss my life. I was a professor at Florida State University College of Law. I was so proud to be a public interest attorney and a mentor to my students. The novel I wrote about my client's stories had just been chosen as the common read for all first-year students at FSU. In August, I was supposed to be the commencement speaker, and then I was supposed to take my brain cancer surviving just turned 70 father on a trip to Machu Picchu. And I don't get to complain that I didn't do any of those things because I am alive. What am I missing here? Because it sounds like there's plenty going right for her. I mean, she just listed she has a new firm, a new law firm. She has a new job, a clerkship. She has a book that her students are going to have to read in law school. Maybe she didn't go on vacation with her father, but she's living with them. I noticed the one thing that she didn't say she misses is her son's having a father. You would think that that would be at the top of the list of things that you miss, you know, having a co-parent, having your children have both parents in their lives, having a father who's alive for them to make memories with, to learn from, to be loved by. She doesn't miss that? Huh. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. This doesn't sound right. This just sounds wrong. Somebody gets something as a result of something else. Like reading between the lines here, it sounds like Dan was the cause of his own murder. Like he did something and as a result, he got murdered. Interesting. In casual conversations, I don't know whether to call him my ex late spouse or my late ex spouse, except that late ex spouse sounds like latex spouse. Last July, someone, and we still don't know who, shot my ex-husband point blank in the back of the head as he pulled into our garage. 
after driving our then three and four-year-old sons to preschool. We married when I was in my mid-20s, when I thought I could cheat the system and marry a man I lacked passionate love for because, hey, didn't that die anyway during marriage? So she's saying she married Dan even though she didn't love him? Great. I saw his intellect and big heart and thought he would make a wonderful father for my children. My children? Possessive, are we? She needed Dan to give her kids. It's like even before they got married, she was taking them away from him. Why didn't she just get a sperm donor? Was she just being pressured by her mother to get married? Why would you get married if this is your mentality? I mean, I, I haven't actually heard about a prenup in this case, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there was one and if she had insisted on, um, on getting one. Our marriage dissolved after the children arrived, as the loneliness of being married to someone that didn't view me as an equal crept in. How does she know Dan didn't view her as an equal? Was it just based on his insistence on living in Tallahassee to keep his job at FSU so he could provide for his family? I'm just curious if there were other reasons. I do believe he loved me the best way he knew how. I mean, he didn't like fiction, so why read my novel? Dan apparently did read the book, according to his mother. Um, his mother apparently stated after the fact that Dan did read the book, and he also wrote about it in his blog. It was logic, not a lack of love. It feels sacrilegious these days, even to suggest something less than heroic about my latex husband, because he was murdered. Well, that hasn't stopped her from speaking negatively about him, has it? But we also know that her faith is not very important to her, so being sacrilegious hasn't deterred her at all. He died violently and young, and likely at the hands of a professional killer. Now, how would you know that back in 2015, Wendy? Sigfredo Garcia wasn't arrested until May 2016. So why did you then think that it was so likely that a professional hitman had killed Dan? I sat on a bench last week to watch the boys play. An older woman sitting next to me commented on how adorable my boys are and asked, what does your husband do? I hate this question. I haven't yet said he doesn't do much because he's dead, but I think it sometimes. Why do you hate the question? You don't have a husband. You're divorced. People aren't asking for an autobiography. Just answer the question. I'm not married. I'm going to fast forward a bit here, a little beyond this little story where she's talking about her relationship with her mother, Donna, and skip over to what the podcast host states as where Wendy's outward reactions don't match her inner emotions. My childhood friend Lisa told me this weekend that she never even knew I was unhappy in my marriage. I had no idea I hid it so well. I always thought that I had an expressive face, the kind that easily registered happiness and disappointments. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that most people think I am very happy all of the time because I smile constantly to try to engage with people, make them smile too. I think this face is a kind of mask that I wear out of a life of endless practice, like a kind of muscle memory for the face. Mm. I can even remember one time learning that a friend's father had died. And upon hearing the news, I smiled. It was a bizarre reaction since I loved my friend and her dad very much. We were 13 and I remember him making pancakes for us many a Sunday morning after a few of us slept over. More than 20 years later, I still feel like a freak show thinking back on that moment. And we've seen this mask, haven't we? We heard her talking out of the mask. Like when she testified that her and Danny were doing pretty well in the days leading up to his murder. And how his mother... Her mother, Donna, liked Danny, and she made him banana bread. This is actually really interesting insight because you always hear, especially in the true crime world, to not judge a person who's just learning about the death of a loved one because people react differently to news or to trauma. 
And many of us do try to put on a happy face, even in times of trials. So I can't necessarily fault Wendy for doing that herself. However, she does recognize that it's something that she does do and that it can come off as inauthentic or even make her look like a weirdo. I didn't say it, she did. Why do I reserve the written word for a place where I can accurately and painfully express myself and the in-person real life version for the Wendy show, jazz hands and all. I wish I could merge us so we could be less of a weirdo. I think for me, a lot of the additional pain I felt you know, on top of, of the murder and everything associated with was it felt unfair that I couldn't at least tell my own story, that the story got told for me. So I think there was an aspect of empowerment, of being able to say, no, this is my side of the story. This is what things look like from my perspective. Here she confesses that her written expression, such as her novel, reflects the true Wendy. She questions how she's able to express herself accurately through her writing, but she's unable to do the same in real life. It's almost as if she's able to hide the truth behind the pages of a book, behind the characters she's developed and the, the situations they find themselves in, but she's not capable of acknowledging the truth of a real life situation when it's looking her in the face. You asked, how, how are we doing really? And I just, I was shaking from head to toe. And I thought, okay, let's just do this. <laughs> let's just dive in. I didn't have a plan to do it, but it just felt unavoidable. The words kind of just flew out of me. But then when I was done, I sat there and I couldn't look anyone in the eye. And I was sweaty. And I just thought, okay. <laughs> Now I've done it. Now it's out there. Now what? She couldn't look anyone in the eye and was sweaty after telling her story. Now, why, dear viewers, do you think that after telling this particular story to a group of classmates, couldn't Wendy look them in the eyes? I have some ideas, but I'd like to hear from you. Danny used to tell me that everyone thought I was such a nice person and such a good person, but he was the only one that knew the truth about what a bad person I was. He was convinced I had deluded everyone but him. I find that telling that Wendy's ex-husband, husband at the time, I'm assuming, told her that she was a bad person and that she had deluded everybody else into believing that she was this wonderful person. So that just leaves me wondering, what did Danny know about her? What had he seen in her that convinced him that she was such, such a chameleon? And she's such a terrible person. And certainly he recognized that she had this mask on, right? That she had the mask on that deluded everybody else into thinking that she was this wonderful human being. It's telling that Wendy says that she's telling the truth in her writing and that she's able to express herself in her writing This seems to be the truth that she's telling. What Danny thought of her. Very interesting to me. What do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about the fact that Dan knew and said that he didn't believe she was a good person? From listening to the testimony, it also seemed like Jeff Lacasse, her boyfriend, after her boyfriend at the time um, of Dan's murder, sort of at the time, I guess, since she said that she had just broken up with him, he also had the same opinion that, um, that she just wasn't as good a person as she portrayed herself to be. 
very interesting. That's something to keep in mind when we're watching her on the stage of trial and giving testimony. Wasn't it her mother, Donna, who told her that she's seen her be such a, a wonderful actress to put on the show of her life? It seems like the people closest to her really could see behind that mask that she wore. And I think that, um, that the community that's observing her actions and putting all these pieces together, I think they see through it as well. So let me know your thoughts. What do you think about this, this short story? Does anything change your opinion about Wendy? Do you feel sorry for her? You feel any sympathy for her? You think she's telling the truth? Can you empathize with her at all? I think those are interesting questions to ponder. Let me know what you think. I'm looking forward to reading your responses, your comments. Well, that's all that I have for you today. Um, I will be coming back with something new, fresh and new for you very soon. I'm working on another video right now, and I hope to see you over there once it's posted. All right, take care. Like, comment, subscribe. See you in the comments. Bye.